What is going on guys? Monks here again with a classic true crime case. It's classic, it's not even that old actually. She went to jail in 2016 so that's only like about 8 years and uh, the woman is out. And uh, we are giving our take on the entire case. And I'll just put it this way. When you re revisit a case that you started off as, as a casual like most of us have, but now that you've done the legwork and the research or whatnot, yeah, your perception changes a lot, and I don't think mine's will be the popular perception. And I even wrote a little poem for you guys about it. Let me just go ahead and read that poem, and if you listen close enough, you kind of see where my mind is in regards to the Gypsy Blanchard case. So, here's the poem. So we've seen enough true crime stories to know that most people, they don't change. They know they're lucky to be free, so they simply rearrange. But when life gets hard again, and to them it feels strange, they will lie, cheat, steal, or kill, you know, something that's deranged. Um, what do you take from that poem? I'll just put it this way. In my opinion, it would not surprise me in the least if Gypsy Rose Blanchard wound up in jail again. I have a muscle question. Do you have any idea why my foot might hurt now? Because it hurts before, uh, I doubt it didn't. Must because I was trying to stay warm. Yeah, maybe. From the way you're crouched. Is your ankle hurting or what? It's my foot itself. It's like on the side. It's like uh, over here. Probably from the way you're leaning on there. Okay. Yeah, you can stand up in here. Oh, okay. Walk back and forth for a little if you get stiff sitting there. Okay. How old are you? 26. They probably won't get stiff yet, then you're too young. <laughs> yeah. So the young man on the screen, that's Nick Godijan. And if you've never seen this footage before, then what would your impression be of him? His demeanor, his body language, the simple fact that he asked someone else why his own foot hurts. And if you felt that maybe his intelligence might be lower than average, or maybe even he's on the spectrum, if you feel guilty thinking this, then just let me alleviate your mind and tell you that he is all of these things. His IQ is in the low 80s, far below the average, and he has been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. He is not sophisticated enough to weave any tall tales or even embellish any truths no matter how boring. He is matter of fact. And I tell you this just to tell you that he doesn't lie. Can you tell me this first? Okay. Did Gypsy know that you were going to kill her mother? Um, honestly, she asked me to. So when you revisit a case that's almost a decade out, as the Gypsy Rose case is, it's no surprise that you come back to find a story that has gone through some revisions, embellishments, and maybe sometimes straight lies that, you know, muddy the waters a bit, but they still do echo the main narrative, which is that Dee Dee had Munchausen syndrome by proxy and used her daughter Gypsy to garner sympathy from everybody. And as I'm talking to you today, I've already done the research. I've recorded most of these talking head parts before I'm recording this one. So unfortunately, the basic understanding of this case that I had before started running up against a brick wall of information and even revelations. I started veering. Okay, my opinion started to change. And so in this video, I, future monks, will be chiming in now and again throughout this video to inject new information or maybe just a new way of thinking about the case and characters. And just know these are my opinions, okay? And I will say this, that definitely, definitely Gypsy is a victim in this case. And with that, I will also add that that is the reason why she really knew how to play one in order to get what she wanted. And hopefully I'll be able to make that make sense by the end of this video. Don't forget this one simple fact, that Dee Dee was no longer here to contribute her side of the story. We only got Gypsy's side of the story. So before we begin the story, we definitely need to outline Munchausen syndrome. And in short, it's when a person creates a symptom, a sickness, you know, some type of affliction so that they can garner 
sympathy from other people. Then there is this hybrid of this mental sickness and it's called Munchausen syndrome by proxy, which is the root of our case today about Gypsy Rose. And I would say this is a much worse sickness because now the same harmful things that that person was doing to themselves, they are doing to others to get that same amount of attention. And in most cases, it's the parent, it's the caretaker that is seeking attention. You know, the glory that they are helping this helpless person, when in reality, it's actually the complete opposite. So in this video, we are going to talk about basically the poster child in recent memory of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. And that would be Gypsy Rose and her mother, Dee Dee Blanchard. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. This is Claudine Petrie, simply known as Dee Dee by those that knew her, and we're going to be referring to her as Dee Dee for the remainder of this video. So, she was living in Golden Meadow, Louisiana, when in 1990, at the age of 24, she found herself entangled with a 17-year-old boy named Rod Blanchard. So Rod, like any other hormone-driven teenage boy, his pull-out game falls short, and Dee Dee winds up pregnant. Now, they do do the right thing and they get married. And once they find out that they were to have a girl, they decide to name her Gypsy Rose. Now, Gypsy was because Dee Dee liked the name Gypsy. And Rose is because Rod really liked the band Guns N' Roses. So on Rod's 18th birthday, he made a wish and he pretty much made his own wish come true. He sat Dee Dee down and told her he thinks that they were together for all the wrong reasons because, you know, something's missing and he didn't really love her. So he leaves his pregnant wife. But we really can't hold it against him because he felt he was doing what was right because he did remain in his daughter's life. He didn't abandon them. And that's always commendable. So now let's go ahead and move to July 27th of 1991, when a healthy baby girl named Gypsy Rose Blanchard was born and everything was fine. Until at only three months old, Gypsy Rose began displaying sleep apnea, which is a condition where you just stop breathing while sleeping. So for a newborn, that's highly concerning. So now Gypsy is hooked up to machines and monitored at the hospital, which if you happen to wonder, they never found any signs of sleep apnea in the girl. But hey, the mom is saying this, so they have to take her word for it. And around this time, they also discovered that she had this condition in one eye called amblyopia, which is also known as lazy eye, where the brain doesn't recognize sight in one eye and could be detrimental for the sight of the good eye if it's left untreated, which resulted in that almost cartoonish thick glasses you see her wear in pictures. So as friends and family poured in unwavering support for the single mom, it would help rejuvenate Dee Dee and keep her in good spirits. And if I had to pick any point in time where Munchausen syndrome by proxy kicked in, I would probably pick this moment. Now, this is a point about Dee Dee that I don't hear many articles talk about because they want to sensationalize how evil Dee Dee is. But this video is not a hit piece on Dee Dee. Dee Dee was actually mentally unstable. Her mental health had deteriorated over time as the story goes. You know, my mother suffered from a lot of mental illness. She was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So, um, you know, my mom used to say that she heard voices and saw shapes. And so future monks chiming in here from the editing room. And so Gypsy says here that her mother is diagnosed schizophrenic and bipolar. Although, upon further research, uh, because of the overlapping nature of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, you usually either have one or the other. So what Gypsy might have wanted here is something called schizoaffective which is basically being schizophrenic with a mood disorder. Extremely hard to diagnose, even today, and let alone the 90s. Now, everything we read about Dee Dee, that she was a liar, manipulator, fraudster, yes, it's all true. Those are all character traits of Dee Dee. But at the heart of her motivations, in this case, it's always for Gypsy. And I know, it's hard to believe, but sometimes the simplest answer is the right one. 
And I've come to believe that she is an overprotective mother, overly protective, I should say, that struggled with depression. And as we carry on, you know, we'll touch on why she became depressed and also why she was so protective of Gypsy. And to me, at least, it makes a lot of sense. So bear with me. So we're still in 1991 and Gypsy is still an infant. And Dee Dee starts to claim that Gypsy has this chromosomal disorder called microdeletions that would cause these unfortunate physical and functional changes in her little girl. Future Monk's chiming in again, and I learned that doctors did inform Dee Dee that baby Gypsy had a chromosomal disorder that was unknown to them at the time, which caused Gypsy to have what is called microcephaly, which is a smaller than average skull and other health complications. So Dee Dee was actually terrified for her daughter's health, but over time, she would use this chromosomal disorder to make false claims. Didi was able to use it as sort of the backbone in which she could use to blame a whole host of health issues that her daughter had and throughout the years that would be such things as epilepsy, hearing impairment, and eventually even leukemia, which we'll get to later. And according to Gypsy herself, when she was just five years old, she went motorcycle riding with her grandfather and they took a little spill. Fortunately, she came away with just an injured knee. And from this, oddly, Dee Dee would get Gypsy a wheelchair and Gypsy could still walk. Her knee wasn't that bad off that she needed a wheelchair, but mommy knows best and Gypsy just started using the wheelchair. So what Dee Dee had done was she was able to convince Gypsy's primary doctor that she had muscular dystrophy, which is a disorder where the muscles weaken over time. So they issued her a wheelchair. So Dee Dee is very persuasive. And here you have Gypsy. She's fine. Maybe she limped a little bit, but she'd heal. In my heart, it really goes out to baby Gypsy. I mean, she's only five years old. My son is five years old now. He loves running, jumping, dancing, everything. And I can't imagine taking that away from a child so young. The confusion in that child's head when your mom tells you that you need to sit and stay in a wheelchair, yearning to walk. And no doubt, Gypsy was playing ball, but she didn't expect to be sitting in that wheelchair forever, which was Dee Dee's plan for her. Okay, so hearing this again, I feel I should clarify that Dee Dee did not make Gypsy believe her legs didn't work. She simply convinced her that it was for their own good. Their own good, meaning both of them, like they're a team. Now, young Gypsy is described as being a sweet, good, and obedient child that wanted to do what was right. And what was right and wrong is dictated by Dee Dee, her mother, at least at this point in her life. Sticking to the timeline, Gypsy is now about of schooling age and she would be enrolled, but only for a few months before Dee Dee pulled her out, citing that she was scared that they wouldn't give her her medicine correctly. So everybody assumed that if she's out of public school, that she would be homeschooled. But according to Gypsy herself, she was given materials, books, or whatnot, and she was just left there to learn how to read by herself. So because of this, Gypsy fell way behind in her education. So with a move like pulling out your daughter from school, Dee Dee no doubt knew she needed to control the narrative about her daughter's well-being. And the best way she figured was to cut Gypsy off from the world, negating any support system that might have derailed her plans. No external forces could whisper in her daughter's ear to tell her that she was actually okay. No one was going to undermine Dee Dee when it came to Gypsy. Not only did her mother control her physical world, her mother was also controlling her mind as well. And Gypsy found herself trapped in what would become total isolation and that would become her normal. Now things are going to get progressively worse, guys. And at some point, Dee Dee thought to herself, hey, she still has a bit of autonomy. She's still eating all by herself. So let's put an end to that. D would convince the doctors, citing that, you know, non-existent muscular dystrophy, that this was now affecting Gypsy's ability to eat. Doctors said, I then say less. 
So now the poor girl is being fed through a feeding tube. And I'll just assume for my sake of sanity that the feeding tube was just for show and that she didn't actually use it when nobody else was around. And so while editing this, I feel like I glossed over the feeding tube part a little too casually because as you can see on the screen, that is what Gypsy had to put in. That is a major invasive surgery because the procedure to have a feeding tube installed is simply terrifying. It's called gastrostomy and doctors will make an incision just above your belly button to then puncture the stomach wall in order to insert the feeding tube directly into your stomach and then the tube can deliver the vital nutrients to the body and at this point in my opinion i am convinced that gypsy has comprehended what her mother was doing and was as complicit in the scam in the sense that this is what mommy said needed to be done but there are situations like this one which i cannot believe that gypsy would just freely go along with that this would be a situation that Dee Dee actually had to gaslight her own daughter into believing that she needed this surgery and sadly this wouldn't be the last time and just to be clear once again I am not saying Gypsy wanted to do any of this this was her normal because of how Dee Dee was Anyways, so over time, Dee Dee would add asthma and seizures to the list of afflictions. The doctor said, I did. And with these negligent doctors making it official on paper, whatever Dee Dee was telling them about to Gypsy, well, that would create this wave of sympathy pouring in for Dee Dee. And you could just imagine how she ate that up. And for the next eight years of Gypsy's life, she would be in and out of doctor's offices, prescribed a litany of medications, and even slept with a breathing machine. She had multiple surgeries. If I could stress that enough, if I'm waiting for a shot, say a flu shot, I'm a grown ass man. I'm nervous as hell before a shot. I can't imagine a child like Gypsy. She'd be scared to death about being cut open. One procedure was with her eyes, which probably was warranted, but she also had to have her salivary glands surgically removed. Yes, you should be scratching your fucking head right now because according to NBC Chicago, Dee Dee had administered this topical anesthetic in Gypsy's mouth that would make her drool constantly, which convinced the doctors that it was necessary to remove her glands. And yes, the fact that the doctors were still taking Dee Dee's word at face value at something this major is alarming. Because don't they need to do some more tests or even talk to Gypsy? So on those doctor's visits, Gypsy was not allowed to utter a word when they were in the doctor's office. She had to sit there on the examination table and just play dumb while Dee Dee did all the talking. You know, just in case their stories didn't align. And that's not to say that some doctors didn't push back and ask for more tests. In those instances, Dee Dee would simply seek a new physician. Gypsy was scared to death every time she had to visit the doctor. She stated, it was panic, desperation, because I was facing another surgery pretty soon and I really did not want to have surgery. What child would, especially deep down in her psyche, she knew she fucking didn't need it. And because Gypsy's salivary glands were removed, her teeth began to rot. And as a result, they would fall out, which probably made Dee Dee happier because it gave Gypsy an even more childish, you know, a look that can rake in more sympathy points. Now, this would also result in Gypsy having to take painkillers, when which she would be addicted to and struggle with. So in many of those old pictures, when you see a young Gypsy, she was most likely high off pain meds, limiting her faculties, giving her an even more adolescent appearance. Another plus for Dee Dee. So Gypsy Rose is a child trapped in complete isolation, but she is still a child and is still in awe of childish stuff. So here's a quick story in which Gypsy actually got to be a kid. So Dee Dee isn't opposed to public functions with her daughter. And if you think about it, well, of course not. There's a lot of people there and she has the wheelchair and Gypsy in it. 
That's a place you could cash in a lot of those sympathy points. And so they go to a birthday party one day. Gypsy is sitting there watching other kids bouncing around on a trampoline. And it looked amazingly fun to her. And Dee Dee, maybe feeling a bit confident that she had coached and programmed Gypsy enough, she slipped away, got into her car, and left for a bit. Gypsy's childlike wonder and excitement could not be suppressed. Once she saw her mother pull out of that driveway, she asked another parent if she too could jump on the trampoline. The parent, maybe a little concerned hearing this from a kid who's sitting in a wheelchair, said, well, of course. Gypsy rose from her wheelchair and began jumping with the other kids. It makes me happy to think of her filled with the exhilaration of jumping and laughing, being a normal kid with other kids. But once she saw her mother pull back into the driveway, people noticed that Gypsy's body seemed to just malfunction instantly at the sight of Dee Dee, and she would hurry back to her wheelchair. Now is 1999. Gypsy's about eight years old. Dee Dee decided to add leukemia to the mix because what tugs at the heart more than a child with cancer. This, <laughs> I had to stop myself for a second when I remembered that Dee Dee really is struggling with mental health issues, but is it wrong for me to be mad? Is it wrong for me to grieve for, you know, baby Gypsy? To find this mother as a truly despicable character? If I do, it would be baby Gypsy first. Now, think about it. To get a cancer diagnosis from a doctor without actually seeing signs of cancer sounds like quite the feat to achieve, even for someone as convincing as Dee Dee. But as I fell into this rabbit hole and digging through the crevices, I learned that there allegedly, allegedly, that there was a Dr. R. Beckerman. Okay, I won't say his first name. And he was their primary physician for a few years. But they were also on a very personal level. The Thanksgiving dinner having together type level. And let's just say that his medical files, allegedly, when it came to Gypsy, were at best inconsistent and questionable. I mean, I don't even know if he believed Dee Dee that Gypsy had all these afflictions. But... He didn't question it, that was his friend. I mean, look guys, this kid is bald. Even though the blood test comes back perfectly fine, it's probably because the kid's in remission, right? And so Dee Dee would get the backing of an actual doctor. So touche, Dee Dee. Now you have everybody that cares about Gypsy scared to death that she's gonna die at any moment. Let's move to the year 2000, and Dee Dee is out driving her car. She gets into a very serious car accident, which leaves her pretty banged up with a badly injured leg. Now, she's no longer in any condition to tend to Gypsy, so they needed help, and they wound up moving in with Dee Dee's father, Claude, and his new wife, Laura Petrie. Now, in all outward appearances, the, the dynamics was like any family, you know, any parent helping out their child. You know, the living situation was a bit cramped, but they were willing to do it because of love, right? And for anybody sensitive to things about children, about PDF things about children, please, fast forward. Turn off the video right now. So things aren't as expected in the Petrie household. Okay, so Gypsy, she liked her grandfather fine. They've hung out before, like the time that they fell off a motorcycle. So everything was fine. She liked Laura and um, everything was fine as Dee Dee was healing. So now let's get to the part of the story that I fucking hate that pop up in these cases way too often. Now, I do have to say alleged, but this old piece of shit, Claude Petrie, Gypsy's grandfather, he is a real piece of work, okay? So, according to Gypsy, during this time, she was about nine years old, she noticed that her grandfather started to get a bit more touchy, more physical with her. And one day, he just literally picks her up off her wheelchair and carried her into the closet where he would perform those unthinkable acts to her. And of course, Gypsy, 
nine years old, extremely shaken afterwards. Her grandfather would try to calm her down, whisper in her ears, you don't want Papa to get in trouble, do you? Don't tell anybody. You don't want Papa to go to jail, do you? You know, the fucking PDF bullshit to brainwash children that everything was normal. Now, I need to fast forward to the future for this part. Okay, so when a documentary team presented Gypsy's grandfather, Claude Petrie, with the accusations that Gypsy was making of S.A., I want you guys, my beautiful viewers, please prepare your uncorrupted ears and minds to what this guy is about to say. The most trash response ever to this heinous accusation. And the first I heard of it. Why do you think Gypsy would say that if it's... I don't know. I don't know, baby. She would try to tell me, I said, no, don't do that. She was the one that was trying to touch me. I said, no, don't do that. When she was, she started that when she was about four years old. I said, don't do that. That's the first I ever heard of it. She would try to touch me. And I said, no, don't do that. She started when she was about four years old. She was trying to touch me. Fucking excuse me? A four-year-old tried to touch you? The only thing a four-year-old is thinking about is candy, ice cream, and adults that make them feel safe. Don't think that we didn't notice that you didn't deny anything. Oh, that's the first I ever heard of it. That's the answer to an accusation of SA? That makes me believe 100% that you SA'd your grandchild and probably SA'd your own child. Maybe that's why Dee Dee's all fucked up in the head, huh? Allegedly. My opinion. <clears throat> So Laura, Claude's wife, suddenly becomes very ill. She wound up being bedridden for nine months. Gypsy and Dee Dee stayed with them for 10 months. So practically the whole time they were there, she was sick and she nearly died a few times. So the belief that is going around is that Dee Dee may have taken some type of offense to something Laura said. Maybe she felt she was a threat to exposing, you know, Gypsy as being a normal child. Now, whatever the case is, Dee Dee is believed to have been sprinkling in some weed killers into her stepmother's food. And it was killing the woman slowly and painfully. It didn't kill her, but it was just enough to shut her down enough to keep her out of Dee Dee's business. Now, here's a bit of not so fun fact, okay? And you could do with it as you will. Dee Dee's real mother, her name was Emma Petrie, and she would meet an untimely, mysterious death just a year before Claude got married to Laura. So when the Petrie family learned that Laura had possibly been poisoned, their minds started to wonder if Dee Dee didn't have anything to do with her own mother's early passing. Okay, so this is the part of the story where there are two narratives about Dee Dee's mom, okay? Her name was Emma, and this is where I think Dee Dee fell into a deep depression, okay? So one narrative, of course, is that she murdered her mom, meaning she didn't get along with her or whatnot, but this is the one that I do believe Dee Dee was actually very close with her mom. Her mother was very active in Dee Dee's life, and she adored her very much. She spoiled her daughter, Silly. She was her best friend. She was her world. And in her untimely passing, this is where Dee Dee falls into a depression that she never really recovered from. She was once bubbly. She was once very social. That girl was no more. Now, I do believe that Dee Dee was always a liar and a manipulator. It's her mother's passing that I figured her life took this dark turn. So she has a child. She is then abandoned by the child's father. She doesn't feel worthy. She is lonely and shifts all her energy to her baby, which is Gypsy. She becomes overly protective of her sickly child and gradually uses that same child she loves to fill in that void for more selfish reasons. Now, back to Laura possibly being poisoned by Dee Dee. Just know that there is no official 
statement about the accusations of poisoning because the Petries never reported it to the police. Now, I'm going to say fortunately, and I am going to say it very loosely, Laura didn't die from the poisoning, at least not immediately, because she would never fully recover her health back. And she suffered all the time, all the way to her death, years down the line. So the talk amongst the family was that Dee Dee might be a bad mother at this point because you know we all know the crazy people in our families and if you don't have one it's probably because it's you and hiding a healthy child in a wheelchair behind doctor visits and feeding tubes it cannot be an easy task especially when you have concerned family members coming around very often some saw in real time gypsy forget that she couldn't stand up and quickly crumpling back into her wheelchair when she remembered. They could obviously see that she could walk and eat without assistance. And so it came to a point where Dee Dee's own sister was convinced enough to reach out to Gypsy's father, Rod Blanchard, to tell him that his daughter could walk. Now, imagine hearing that about your daughter when your ex-wife for years led you to believe that she was basically paraplegic. Now, like I said before, I get a sense that Rod is a good man, you know, from what I could gather about him. He worked as a shipmaster and was away for months on end throughout the year, but he was there for Gypsy when he could, and he always paid his child support so that Dee could be the sole caretaker of Gypsy. So Rod's payments and government assistance allowed Dee Dee to never have to find a job. And concerning Rod, let's just say that none of us are perfect. There might have been plenty of things that he could have done better to handle this information. I, I wouldn't fault Rod too much considering Dee Dee had everyone fooled. And all we need to know is that Gypsy loves her father even today and doesn't blame him. So if she doesn't blame him, we could leave it at that. So a lot of people are going to remember 2005, especially if you lived in Louisiana. That's when Hurricane Katrina hit. And while Kanye blamed George Bush, Dee Dee blamed the hurricane for destroying Gypsy's birth certificates and medical records. So as Louisiana is picking up the pieces and rebuilding, Dee Dee is in the doctor's office convincing them that Gypsy has leukemia and is four years younger now. Now, doctors understandably, after such a major catastrophe, they're exhausted. And it was true that all the records were lost about this child. So before you know it, Gypsy was undergoing rounds of chemo and surgeries. Let that sink in. I've had someone close to me, okay, go through chemo and the way it made them feel, I would not wish upon any of my enemies. Mm -hmm. Dee Dee had convinced Gypsy herself that she had cancer. She believed that she was going to die. How scary is that for anyone, let alone a child? The lengths that this woman, I'm not gonna even call her Gypsy's mother because that title to me means somebody that takes care of their child, okay? So Dee Dee, went to a crazy length, she's crazy, to keep this child as sick as possible. And that's pure selfishness and evil. I wish she only had Munchausen syndrome where she would just destroy herself for attention, but by proxy, it's just so infinitely more heinous when an innocent, helpless child is the victim. Gypsy, since she could remember, her life was misery and honestly, we all know what Dee Dee has coming, right? In this story, we all know what she has coming. And I'm not gonna say she deserved it, okay? Because somewhere inside me, I do feel she did not deserve what's coming, but we won't shed a tear either. So by September of 2005, she and Gypsy Rose moved to Aurora, Missouri, where they rented an apartment. And this move was, in a sense, kind of the perfect time because 
Dee Dee probably could sense that her credibility was starting to wane in Louisiana, especially around all the family. She needed a new blank canvas. She needed new locals to spin her lies. So the harrowing story of Gypsy's life and ailments through Dee Dee, of course, began to ripple through this new community, this new town, and soon Dee Dee. A heart full of attention was being celebrated for her perseverance and complete devotion to her sickly daughter. The yarn that Dee Dee was spinning was so heartwarming that the local news stations reached out to her for interviews and, you know, Dee Dee ate up all that shit. And if you watch these news interviews, you could see how lovable she actually could be. It took something like a hurricane to make us have a happy ending. Dee Dee was happy enough just having medical care for Gypsy. She says she never expected this. It's amazing. It's amazing the outpouring of love and support. And this publicity opened up new avenues of opportunity for them. They were given medical trips to Mercy Children's Hospital. They got to go to Disneyland. A fund was even opened up for them where the public as well as celebrities would donate thousands to them. One notable was country star Miranda Lambert, alone donated $6,000 to help out with Gypsy Rose's medical expenses. It turns out St. John's already owned this house, and with the help of local donations, it was turned into a home. I think that's just kind of what we're all about. You know, we're all about doing what we can to help people that are in a bad situation. It's beautiful, and it's happy, and it's full of love. So now let's move on to 2011, and Gypsy is now 20 years old, based on her real age. But of course, Dee Dee's griff didn't pay off as well with an adult. So where she used to roll Gypsy's age back maybe two years, she now cranked it back five years so that everyone thought Gypsy was still 15. The money was good, the attention was better, but only for Dee Dee. For Gypsy, it's still the same isolation and control, and not many 20-year-olds in 2011 didn't have access to the internet. Dee Dee knows that letting her daughter converse with the outside world online was trouble. Now, Gypsy, of course, did have a Facebook account, but that was controlled by Dee Dee, you know, to pander and update the world on the newest affliction Gypsy may have. And Gypsy, being a normal girl, hormonal fueled girl, she would use the times her mother was asleep to secretly create her own Facebook account so that she could, you know, chat and meet new people, boys specifically. And she totally was entering this space in pure ignorance, just happy to be talking to anyone, even a disgusting 36 year old man that we have to call Dan because his identity is not known. Future Monk's here again, and so it turns out that if you dig deep enough, you can actually find his full name and even a photo of him. He was also a married man at the time, and so adding this to his plans of not only cheating on his wife, but with that of someone he thought was 15 years old, hey, we could always say Dan, which is actually his first name. Dan is really a piece of shit. But considering everything is alleged, I'm going to keep that as is, especially when there is a version of this story that paints Gypsy as the aggressor in the relationship, the one that bound herself to him even when he wanted out, and the one that initiated everything. And to be honest, I kind of believe that Gypsy would do this because desperation makes you cling to any signs of hope. Except 911, of course. <laughs> Never 911 for some reason. Let's not even call him Dan. Let's call him 36. So 36 struck up a conversation with someone he believed was 15 years old. Certain details in the story I'm about to tell you is vague at best, but as far as I can tell, the story did happen. So with each passing conversation with 36, Gypsy, of course, grew more comfortable. He's grooming, of course, which eventually led to her revealing to him that she could walk. Now, they were somehow able to arrange a meeting 
although briefly, in public so that she could show him that she could stand up, she could walk. And it was as Dee Dee feared concerning the internet, as Gypsy began to spill the tea on the entire life that she was desperate to get out of. 36 was right there to fuel the fire that he would help her. And so they devise a plan to escape. But of course, like any toxic union, the person being abused, meaning Gypsy, sometimes would be mentally attached to their abuser, which gave Gypsy pause and a little hesitation to go through with such a plan. But there was a last straw, and that's when Gypsy happened upon her own medical card that Dee Dee had been keeping in a secret place. She looked at the birth date, 1991 instead of the 1995 that she herself thought she was born on. She was a grown woman, a full adult and not a 15 year old. Now I would say, Gypsy's always harbored the knowledge that her mom was full of it because her life, you know, it was a lot. But learning about her real age, actual physical proof of the bullshit, it clarified that belief that her mom didn't have the best intentions for her and even this 36 year old creeper he did give gypsy that confidence to make a change and at the same time when you hear the plan 36 had it makes you sick to your stomach once again so dan's plan was to pick up gypsy in the middle of the night where he would take her away to a farm in arkansas great fucking plan 36 a better plan would be 911, you piece of shit. So on the night that this plan would go down, okay, she was able to get a hold of Dee Dee's cell phone and text Dan that she was ready to head out. And I want you guys to get this. When you first heard Dan's plan that he was gonna sweep her away to Arkansas to this farm, you would think that Dan would have a car to pick her up. But no, that night, all she did was sneak out her window and hitchhike. So she basically had to risk being kidnapped just before she made it to a PDF file's house. And spoiler alert, nothing about his plans or even himself was remotely accurate to how he presented himself online because the place that she was hitchhiking to was not Dan's house, it was Dan's friend's house. So now, possibly two creepers instead of one. So when she gets to the house, 36 lets her in. This is where he drops on her that he is actually on parole. So he can't even leave the state. So this plan of a little farm in Arkansas, that wasn't even an option. He just straight lied about that. And here comes a very strange part of the story as I utter this, but thank goodness for Dee Dee. Now, how Dee Dee tracked down Gypsy, this is only gonna be my speculation. Information about this, like I mentioned before, is vague. If you guys know more about it, please fill me in, but this is what I think happened. So, I assume that because Gypsy was using Dee's phone that night, she woke up to see these text messages that she didn't make, right? So, she figured, oh, my daughter's also missing, so she must have been the one and she must have been communicating with this person somehow, turned on the computer, found that secret Facebook account, and uh, just started reading the messages. And of course, there's that address. So she goes to that address, pounds on the door, and she does find Gypsy there. And of course, this is fresh. Gypsy is not about to just go back to that hellhole that is with Dee Dee. And this is according to Gypsy herself. Her mom convinced her that night that it was okay if she continued to talk to 36. It was okay if they continued to see each other if she just came home. But once Gypsy agreed, according to the Hollywood Reporter, when they got home, Dee Dee chained Gypsy to the bed for two whole weeks in handcuffs and a dog leash. And she became physically abusive, hitting her daughter with her hands, coat hangers, whatever she could use. And Gypsy, I don't know why she felt the need to clarify, but it wasn't until she tried to run away that Dee Dee was actually violent. When arguably what she was doing, this mental warfare she did to her daughter, Sometimes I feel is 
worse than physical pain. And during this two weeks of torture, Dee Dee would also break Gypsy down mentally again. She had to reprogram her, I guess, in a sense, bringing down her self-esteem, saying things along the lines that you will never find love, you will never be happy. And the saddest thing Gypsy said, I felt, was that Gypsy believed it. But it still didn't change the fact for Gypsy that she still wanted a life without her mother. So now let's move to 2012 and Gypsy found a way to get back online. Her hormones are still there and she's still looking for boys. Now she's looking for boys on this Christian website. And here is where she meets 26-year-old Nick Godijan from Big Ben, Wisconsin. So after two weeks, they started to get comfy with each other. They started talking about love. They started talking about sex, you know, real Christian-like things. And they began talking about their life together, fantasizing about what they would do, you know, the house they would have, the many, many children. And once you get into this realm, you are officially an online couple. But because of their circumstances, this would go on for the next two years. They would never meet. There was even an instance where one of Nick's exes was compelled to jump into uh, Gypsy's DMs and tell her that Nick was not a good guy. But you can't tell that to the new girlfriend. She's too in love to let that interfere. As a matter of fact, a bad boy was probably what she was actually looking for. Now, I want to say this while I have it fresh in my noggin, that... The way Gypsy was moving, I would, I would suspect that she was messaging other guys as well. I mean, that's how you do an online dating world, right? So isn't it possible that Nick was the one that bit? It's like you're going fishing, right? You want something done, something that is not necessarily Christian-like. So not many people are going to be down for that. So doesn't she have to kind of, you know, throw out a lot of reels, you know, throw out a lot of bait out there until finally somebody bites? And couldn't that be that one person was Nick? That bit? I just want to throw that out there saying that somewhere inside me, I believe that uh, in my opinion, she was looking for a useful idiot because by 2015, their conversations had this new dynamic topic, if you will, which Gypsy labeled their dark impulses. She even had an alter ego named Ruby in which she would uh, deem her evil side. And Nick, of course, he had his own evil side as well, and he named him Victor, some vampire that enjoyed killing. Around this time, Nick would finally make that 500 mile trip. I do believe it's on a bus from Wisconsin to Missouri in March of 2015. Now, an emotional and happy meeting. And once he left, everything went back to normal. But their conversations were now far from normal. They both wanted Gypsy free of her mother. And once again, I will add, calling the police should have been... <laughs> Look, as the saying goes, common sense is not that common. So let's continue. By mid-June, they were discussing things like knives, duct tape, and murder. Now, Nick definitely is not mentally handicapped, and at the same time, he is far below the 100 average. His learning and processing abilities are slower than the average person, and he also shows signs of autism. And I don't doubt for a second that he was in love with Gypsy, 100%. She was his obsession and was willing to do anything to protect her. So Gypsy told him everything Dee Dee did and of course makes Nick feel some type of way and wanted to save her and protect her. And so this was, I guess, the perfect time for Gypsy to pepper in the idea of killing her mother. Gypsy threw it out there, but Nick didn't shoot it down. But he didn't readily agree, but in the end, she finally talked him into it. So they put their heads together and they came up with a three-step plan. And I do believe I have the right order because I read some articles where the order was a tad different, but it didn't really matter. So I'm about to tell you the order that I believe is correct. If I got it wrong, please let me know. 
I don't want to be wrong. So there is plan A and plan A is pretty simple and I'm going to call it the Cinderella plan. And that is to have Dee Dee meet Nick. And the most important part of this plan is for Nick to leave a very good impression. So Dee Dee had purchased these tickets to see Cinderella live. Okay. A live action shoot of Cinderella. Gypsy would be decked out in Cinderella gear as well. And so that's why we call it the Cinderella plan. Okay. So it's pretty basic. Nick is supposed to be posted somewhere in the crowd before they go into the show. And he is to bump into Gypsy's wheelchair and be completely apologetic, you know, to Dee Dee, to Gypsy, and then have this nice conversation. Now, as cartoonish and sitcomish as this would appear to us, it actually worked because they were having like this nice little exchange and to Gypsy and Nick, it felt very successful because Dee Dee was very kind to Nick. So the impression was made. Now during the actual show, Dee Dee would say that she needs to go pee and she starts wheeling herself towards the women's restroom. This was actually a sign for Nick to follow her and in the women's restroom, they would actually consummate their love. They made love, they had sex for the first time. And this was actually plan C. Remember there was three of them, okay? There's A and then there's C. I'll talk about B in a second. So C was to get her pregnant. Okay, so C is done with, it, was, it wound up being unsuccessful. Just spoiler alert. But plan A would go to shit once they were back in the theater because Dee Dee saw how chummy they were together, how close they were. And turns out Dee Dee only liked Nick as a stranger that would just go away, but not a stranger that was trying to hit on her daughter. <laughs> so Dee Dee gets angry and takes her away. So plan A fails. So now they move to plan B, kill Dee Dee. So in the other articles I read, they had kill Dee Dee in plan C. But when you move it to plan B, you realize that there was no way out for Dee Dee past plan A. The way other articles had it at the end, if plan A failed, they would have plan B where she gets pregnant. And maybe now that she's pregnant, you know, everything will be hunky dory with Nick because Dee Dee had no choice but to accept this incoming baby but when you move that killing Dee Dee to plan B she really had no escape deep in the night of June 9th of 2015 Nick Godijan stood outside his beloved's house Gypsy let him in she handed him some duct tape gloves and a knife and then she went to hide in the bathroom and covered her ears. Nick found Dee Dee asleep in her bedroom and stabbed her 17 times. Now, believe it or not, things will get a tad more depraved because right after the murder, Nick is obviously covered in blood splatter and both will not deny this part. He and Gypsy go to her bedroom and have sex. And Nick would even proudly tell this story to the police that Gypsy went down on him for the first time while they were making love. And then there was Gypsy's side of the story, and it's a lot more disturbing. He, he killed my mom. He killed your mom. He knows, I know it. Um, he, he started walking to... Um, to my mom's room, and I told him that he needed to go outside. We need to go outside. Um, what was your mom doing at that point? Was she asleep? Or she was asleep, asleep. and I, I got up to use the restroom. And at that point, um, he had put me in the bathroom, and he had locked the door. Okay. And um, he went to my mom's room, and I heard. You heard your mom crying. You heard, you heard your mom crying. And you heard your mom calling out your name. Mm -hmm. she, was she was screaming. She was screaming. And he opened the door. And he was covered in his hands. And he had cut himself with his fingers. You know, if it was
Is this it, left hand or his right hand? Um, it, it was... Um... Oh, gosh, it was this hand. Okay. Okay. Exactly. You don't know how he is. Okay. You don't know how he is. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. And, um, he made me take off all my toys off the bed. So he made you take all your toys off your bed? Okay. And he raped me. And he raped you? So she says that after Nick killed Dee Dee, he comes back and he is livid. He is angry, technically disappointed, because she says that he wanted to R-word Dee Dee before he did the killing, but Gypsy didn't allow that and it made him upset. So what did he do after that? He R-words Gypsy. Whose story seems to make more sense to you? I mean, I'll give you my take. I'll just say it this way, okay? As forthcoming as Nick is, if you watch any of his interviews, if you watch the documentaries that they had, he seems very forthcoming, like he has nothing to hide. He knew they got him dead to rights, and he didn't seem to be dishonest about anything. So the next clip you're about to see, that's this is Nick Go to John's mother. And you guys listen for yourselves and take away from it as you will. Okay, so that's why we kind of, you know, treat him like... When he was the last doctor we talked to, they said his mind is probably always going to be 15, 16, right around there. So we always try to keep a close watch on him when he said he wanted to go down there. I mean, I was a basket case. I'm like, you've never been out on your own. Do you know what I mean? So um, the last time he didn't tell us, though. So. Okay. He got a cab and never said anything to us. And I saw a taxi pull up in my driveway. Okay. And I ran out there right as he was loading his stuff. And I'm like, where are you going? He's like, well, I didn't think you were going to let me go. I'm like, well... I mean, why would, you know, it's not okay for you to just take off. You don't tell us where you're going. So um, I just, he's never done anything like this. Not, nothing violent, you know what I mean? That's why I'm in shock. Okay. I don't when I think he's madly in love with this I girl. know, I know. I mean, that's the way it works, though, when you have what he has. It's like your mind focuses on one thing, do you know what I mean? Yes, ma'am. So um, I never thought he'd do something like this, though. And them making love after this sounds a bit more plausible than him R-wording the girl that he was obsessed with. I'm ready for the hate comments. <laughs> okay, so they flee the house and they were able to find $4,400 in cash that Dee Dee had been hiding. And then they vanish to some motel. And we know that that's the days in afterwards. Then this strange Facebook post appears. Now, we all know what this says. Now, wouldn't that seem to be the actions of someone looking to get caught? There was only one person with access to that Facebook account to make that post. So the person writing it, of course, Gypsy, she knew writing that would alarm some people, you know, you know, alarming them enough to go check on Dee Dee as if she was impatient that they weren't finding her quick enough. Doesn't that seem like the actions of someone who is looking to get caught? Someone who never really planned on getting away with it because there was nothing to get away with in her mind because someone else did the killing and the fact that she said that that same man r-worded her and painted him to be some type of sex crazed lunatic and then running off with him is a stretch i would say because basically you're leaving one bad situation for another bad situation is anybody with me that there were just so many ways out she could have called the police she literally could have got up out of her wheelchair and ran away and told somebody about the things that were going on with her mother, that her mother was not mentally well, she would have been taken out of that situation. I've heard her speak nowadays, you know, in interviews or whatnot, and she is pretty well spoken. She seems to have all her faculties in order, and I'm pretty sure those same faculties were present even back then, though she was young and ignorant. So, in my opinion, I think she just wanted her mom dead. And like I said before, she found her weapon. She found her useful idiot. She found Nick go to John. So after that horrible Facebook post, of course, people are going to wonder where Dee Dee is. They go check up on her, and of course, they find her dead. They find her daughter's wheelchair still there now. Was she kidnapped 
or did she run away? Now, when I read this next part, I am completely convinced that Gypsy was the mastermind of this whole thing going forward. Okay, because once I tell you this, I don't think you would even believe it. Simple question. What would you do if you had a murder weapon? You just murdered somebody and you're holding on to this murder weapon, okay? You try to get rid of it, right? You would at least just throw it into a pond, try to destroy the weapon. There's a million ways to make this thing vanish, but for crying out loud, what you do not do with the murder weapon is send it to your home address. This is why I believe Gypsy was masterminding this whole thing because the murder weapon was sent to Wisconsin to Nick go to John's house Your husband might remember is that recently Nicholas received a package in the mail Yeah, okay. I mean, I don't know about it, but if he says yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and that was uh, the what? They mailed it from their house there to your house. Are you serious? Yes, ma'am um, And that was located in your house I mean, it was just, my son has never done anything yeah. violent, so it's like... That's what he her, said. I mean, if... Gypsy really had him wrapped around her fingers and Nick really is a sandwich short of a picnic. And what else don't you do if you're looking to not get caught, especially if you have like $4,000 in your pocket? You keep it moving. You don't go to the one place that they definitely will go to. The Waukesha County Sheriff's Department raided Go to John's home and found them in there. So now Gypsy and Nick, they're in custody. And nobody ever said that this murder didn't happen, that they didn't do it. So Gypsy, she even admitted that she is the cause of why her mother is dead, that she's complicit and even talked Nick into doing it. But this is in a state, Missouri, that doesn't recognize accessory to murder. And so Nick, he admits to killing Dee Dee, so he's gonna get life in prison without the possibility of parole. And this is where Nick pretty much laid it all out pretty honestly, in my opinion. He really didn't hide anything and admit it to everything, matter of factly as well. And he'll spend the rest of his life in jail for this starting in 2016. So now let's go ahead and come back to the world that we live in today. So Gypsy also sent, was sent to prison in 2016 and she would only serve eight of those 10 years. And on December 28th of 2023, she had a taste of freedom again. And really, this is the first taste of freedom ever in her life, right? She ran from her, she was, she was never free until now. But while she was gone, the world moved rather quickly, you know, in this internet age. And the landscape that she left behind was completely different. As she came out, she was a bona fide superstar. Countless videos were made about her while she was gone. HBO docs, Dr. Phil did a doc, Monks, me eventually did a doc. She had become a household name, you know, to, to people that followed true crime. You know, TikTokers were TikToking about her. Hell, there were countdown parties being had, awaiting for her release. And when she was finally released, she took an Instagram selfie and wrote first selfie of freedom. That post garnered 875,000 likes instantly, garnered 760,000 followers or whatnot, and uh, her TikTok numbers were even more insane. I do believe she has like over 10 million followers on TikTok. Oh, imagine that. So I decided to click on some of the happier times with the man I figured she is now married to. Mind you, I'm not keeping up with this is all new to me and uh, there was a man named Ken that was her husband and apparently they are to have a baby together they are expecting a girl very soon and in this image here she says that the baby is the size of a bell pepper and this was August 21st not too long ago from today when I'm making this video and then I'm completely confused because I come across this picture and who the fuck is that Who's this Ryan guy who is what was her husband? And so, of course, I had to go do a little digging to to understand the timeline here. So here's what I gathered, OK, from what's going on as my feeble mind um, started to get smoother as I did this research. You know, this kind of stuff, it just isn't my cup of tea. So Ryan 
married Gypsy while she was still in prison in 2022. Now, when she got out, they tried to make it work. They went on a lot of interviews and podcasts or whatnot, you know, making the rounds. But they could not make it work because she couldn't stop thinking about her ex, which is this guy now, Ken, the guy who's the baby's father, which I just found out back then was her past fiance. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? How many, how many times can you be a fiancé? So, again, I had to go a little further back. I found out that Ken Urker, he was a lurker <laughs> that watched HBO's documentary Mommy Dead and Dearest, you know, about Gypsy. And so he started writing to Gypsy in prison around 2017, okay? That's like a year after she got in, and they eventually became pen pals. Now... Ken would then propose to her while she's in prison in 2018, and she accepted. And there you go. Fiancé. But things didn't work out between her and Ken. It really broke her heart, though, uh, when, when that was called off. And then there was Ryan, this guy. He swooped in and straight had a private prison ceremony in June of 2022. I did love Ryan. Ryan and I spent three years of a relationship together. It was just a different love than I have for Ken. Um, he is an extrovert, so um, I am an extrovert when it comes to people that I'm comfortable around and an introvert around strangers. So put the two of us together. And the best way that I can describe this is um, I'm like a, a free pony running through the fields and he is my other free pony running through the fields with me. So right there, I really thought that she would make Ken like a different animal after explaining that they are different people. But hey, two free ponies in a field, if that's the best way she could, she could describe it, then hey, whatever. So here's my final take. If this case ended where it was in 2016 and we never heard from Gypsy again, I think it would be a more compelling case for future true crime fans, let's say. To me now, it's watered down. And it's not as compelling because of how it's turned into some type of reality show. And sadly, the most troubling fact is that a large chunk of society embraced a person that basically hired a hitman to kill her mother. I mean, the payment, yeah, it wasn't cash, but it was a promise of a life together to a man she knew uh, was obsessed with her. And like I said at the top of the video, I wouldn't be surprised if Gypsy found herself in trouble with the law again because hurt people, they do hurt people. But hey... To each their own. She'd still be in jail if this wasn't Missouri, but it was, so time served. And then, when I saw this TMZ headline, I was so fucking done with this case.